welcome sellers we are starting actually we are ending the 1939 war tournament it's a competitive environment where you're played against your peers and you play up to you the first players to get the five wins ends the tournament but not necessarily and win the game or win the tournament overall so losses do not count against you in this tournament so you can go five wins and three losses and what that does is sets up eight games is the number of games you have to play to match those wins or exceed those wins and then you become the war tournament champion so that's the basis of it and also we compete amongst our peers so bring your rating in if you're 1400 1300 1200 1550 whatever you're going to be playing against your peers and you're not going to be bottom feeding you're not going to be being assassinated by these guys with the higher ratings they're going to be theoretically your peers obviously if you're a newer player your rating hasn't been established per the asl players rating and but we could get that established for you come in play your games we have a list of games you could play players all across the planet you set up your games on the asl skills discord server after you uh submit a request to play the war on that server on that discord server and then you just join in you'll see a list of players your rating will be amongst those and we rank those and you play plus or minus 75 points within that rating you line up as many games as you want typically it's 10 to 15 players are within your range at any given time and we have a list of about i think the war 39 had a 35 to 38 scenarios that are balanced very well theoretically by the roar uh so we're about to start up in 1940 um the war 1940 again usually uh it will take three months for the players to accumulate five wins and that depends on how fast you play and how many games you play so it's not one game a month one game a month's not going to cut it one game every two weeks might do it you know if you're looking for an extended play you might get six games in in those three month periods but if you could hammer a game a weekend which a lot of players have been doing then you could get four games in, in one month pretty simple or maybe three games one month and two games next month and three games a month after that so uh typically if you have a you know 75 percent win ratio your scores will go up and then therefore you'll be playing players that were ranked higher than you but now you're entering that range so now you're going to be playing still competitively throughout the entire time and your monthly ratings are updated on a monthly uh your ratings are updated on a monthly basis so we just had our updated ratings for april those players adjusted depending on their wins and losses the previous month and doug rimmer is doing a super good job on getting those uh games inputted into the asl players rating i track the points again myself and he'll have official points for you at the you know essentially at the end of the day but i have a preliminary rating for you and then we'll go with that and then match you up uh if you're killing the competition you'll rise up fast enough and then you'll be playing theoretically against your peers as you reach up or go down depending on which way you go but anyway it's not a per round basis you don't have to finish the game against opponent number one to play opponent number two to play opponent number three you can play them all at the same time you can play super long scenarios if you want to play the hill 621 in your tournament you can play it it might take you a month to finish it but that game is on your roster and you could play that while you're playing the other smaller games so you don't have to finish one game before you start another that's the key that's the critical part it allows you to play lots of players it allows you to play different types of scenarios whether you want to play a long scenario or a super short one and then the 1940 war that's coming up that's starting in may um it will be um from a wide range of sources they're going to have action packs in there 
uh, and uh, just a, a whole number of sources from the scenario selection. And I also narrowed it down to 55% ratio win ratios for the scenarios. So the scenarios theoretically are balanced. And then if you're playing someone at your skill level, you should theoretically have a 50% chance of winning every game you play. You know, you're not, and you, but you shouldn't have those free wins if you're playing someone super low uh, skill level than you or super high. You're not going to have that high percentage chance of losing any game you play. So the idea is to have fun, play lots of ASL, learn as this video is going to hopefully uh, encourage you to do that. And I'll be probably releasing them through the wars. I didn't do it the first one because we were busy. And also that, um, you know, you could play multiple games at one time. And that's the key is uh, you don't have to do one game per week. You know, one every other, however time you, you want to fit it in. But you're looking at uh, six to seven games in three months, which is a pretty good pace. You know, pretty good pace. I think a lot of players involved so far are enjoying it. I know I'm enjoying it. I'm watching the uh, participation online and uh, and so on and so forth. So what we're here doing today is taking one of the scenarios that happens to be one of the more popular ones from the war. It's Toten Zontag. And um, I didn't cover all three logs that I wanted to get to. But what, um, what I'm doing is, is highlighting the scenario, at least in this first episode, looking over the scenario special rules, looking over the OBs and the victory conditions and seeing how that comes into play, sort of like I've done on the um, uh, war rooms. But this is going to essentially be a comparison between the number of logs that we're getting for the games. So as the players play the games, they log them, submit them on the Discord site, I will download them. And whenever we get three games, then what we'll do is we'll do like a comparison analysis. You know, uh, what common mistakes we see in the games. Are there certain rules we're not using properly? Things like that. So we'll summarize those like in the logs, just like we did with um, Tactical Tuesdays. We'll go in there. We'll highlight things that we need to look for. Routing. In this case, we're looking at routing, fire lanes, and um, options uh, and vic essentially victory conditions for the for the scenario. So I think this one's probably maybe 90 minutes or so. Uh, so hit a double speed, you know, play through it. If you find a section that you're interested in, we talk about fire lanes a lot. We talk about routing options a lot. And options as you have as an offensive and defensive player during each route phase and movement phase that you have, might have to consider to make sure you don't lose units, especially in a game like Toten Zontag, where prisoners are key and route paths will determine victory or loss. So let's get to it. We're going to jump into it. We had a good crowd tonight, and um, we'd like to encourage you to join. Uh, if you're just a rigaroo player, you want to play players at your skill level, you don't like to go to tournaments, this is a very good medium in between there. You can arrange the matches at your whim. Uh, it seems like a lot of guys didn't take too much time getting matches going. So because of the availability of players. And uh, I think we have 39 signed up right now. Uh, so we could kick, kick it at 50. I think I'm looking for 11 more players just to top it out at a clean 50. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get about 20 to 30 games registered per month. So that way you'll be on your victory. And you'll be on your way to uh, learning more ASL. And again, the idea is to get some logs, summarize the logs, do comparisons, and then hopefully learn from them. So see what you could learn from our, what we covered just today. I think we covered two or three turns in the first Toten Zone Tog. We'll kind of finish them up later and, um, and we'll increase the pace later. And then we'll see at the end, after looking at all three logs, you know, maybe there's a particular strategy that we could look for when we're playing a scenario like Toten Zone Tog. Are there certain things we need to look for, to look out for? We don't want to get caught in this situation. Maybe we want to move over here. Maybe we want to do this, you know, something like that. That's why we're piecing it apart. We may not know that in the beginning, but giving experience and reviewing some of these logs, 
will give us some of those insights that other players have had, you know, during their games and using their game plans, you know, we're not criticizing, we're not choosing the best way to win the scenario. We're looking for little clues of the scenario that will better our gameplay and our style of play, you know, so everyone won't have the same style, but your style doesn't mean it's to more worse than the next person. That's all there is to it. So if you like to be aggressive, be aggressive. If you like to be conservative, be conservative. But understand that your style may or may not fit with that particular scenario. But that's okay, because as you play more and more, you'll learn to adjust your style on a scenario basis. Okay, that's enough rigmarole. Let's head on out to the battle. It's between the Polish and the Germans. This is Toten Zontag in uh, Genoese, Poland, uh, the 10th of September, 1939, early in the war. This is a popular scenario, so let's get to it. Thanks a lot for watching. Again, one of the one of the purposes of roar is to, not roar, but the uh, war is to, um, is to essentially brief, uh, focus on some of the games that either we've played or other players have played or lessons we could learn or comparisons that we could have for the different scenarios. It's not to necessarily criticize anyone's play to see which one's bad or worse or whatever like that. It's just by looking at people's logs and either talking with them if they're available or going over just standard strategies and standard practices um, based upon the victory conditions, the OBs, scenario special rules. Uh, we can kind of like judge uh, how the scenario is going for one side or the other. And of course, dice rolls always change the results of the entire game. That's how, we, that's why we play the game is because, you know, if you have the best plan, they use sometimes don't work or, or if you're just lucky, sometimes it's good enough to win. So, um, Toten Zontag seemed to be a popular one. Again, I think there are three scenarios here. I just played this one not too long ago against Dimitri and, um, and I saw some like, some of the comparisons of the shortcomings of my game, and I see some of the sort of uh, differences uh, between that and these games here. I, I reviewed these three games today uh, earlier, and there's differences in each one, to be honest with you. And uh, because there are differences in each one, we could try to compare and contrast and see what we can gain you know, why did this particular scenario happen this way? How did this happen that way? Yes, guys, we'll fail morale checks at inopportune times. But how do you deal with that? And um, again, just like we did in with uh, with our Tactical Tuesdays and Starter Kit, I think in this one here, this is, uh, you could kind of picture this. If you've played enough games or if you haven't played anything at all, this is a standard um uh, first of all, again, you have to understand the victory conditions and what it takes for one side to win over the other. And uh, so in Don't Toten's on talk here, the mission or the victory conditions, it's with the friendly fire scenario, so they have to change it. I'm not sure why they have to change the wording. I really don't think they have to. But the victory conditions are the Polish win at game end. If six or more German squad equivalents, which means, you know, you add up the half squads too, are eliminated or captured, and then each wooden building, which is way on the left-hand side, containing one good order Polish squad equivalent at game end counts as one German squad eliminated. So it's really kind of odd victory condition. So the Poles need to, A, kill Germans. And so since they outnumber them, uh, you know, three to two, I think they have a 50% increase. They have 11 and a half squads where the Germans have seven and a half squads of just average, you know, uh, ability 467s are just your average run of the mill Germans. The leadership is pretty mediocre at best. 8081, couple lights and a medium, uh, and the mortar as well, and six concealments to start at the top. So, um, uh, the other thing of note is good order Polish squad equivalents. So, you can have uh, m units, Polish units in close combat will not satisfy their victory conditions at the game end that's one thing that the germans could anticipate let's say the poles do get back there if they manage to at their last turn because oh, actually the germans don't have a second turn the poles have a first turn which is another important fact that you have to notice there are six and a half turns which means the german the poles get seven turns to move to do it that 
and the Germans have to win in six, essentially win in six turns. So if the Poles occupy stuff on their last movement phase, the Germans uh, can only essentially defensive fire them out of it. And uh, that's probably about it. So that's that's a big difference in the game. If the Germans had a second, had a sort of like a uh, response turn to the, to, to the Poles, it could make a difference in um, what the Poles have to do. So um, this one gives the advantage to the Poles. So uh, let's go to the sp special rules real quick and see how they might impact the scenario we're looking at. Again, not only do we look at the OBs, the OBs are obviously the things that pops out on the page, you know, which squads do I get, which tanks do I get, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the special rules can really, the special rules really make and break of what you can and cannot do in this scenario. Uh, first one are usually the weather rules, things like that. EC are dry with no wind start. Kindling is not applicable. Uh, that's your standard kindling uh, rule, not being, you can't burn shit. You know, it'd be nice to burn like uh, middle, the middle uh, trees, especially with dry temperatures. Um, that it creates a problem. So now, uh, EC are dry, and 90% of the games are EC are moderate. So if EC are dry, how does, does that, how does it impact the game, or does that impact the game at all? Does anybody know in their reading uh, if, if they played it or not played it, or if they just know about EC? How does the EC being dry do anything in this scenario? Does it or does it not? And if it does, what's the what instances come up that would bring dryness into into application? Does anybody have any idea, opinions on that? I mean, if you say, "Hey, I have no clue," don't know why it's there, because I didn't know why the hell it was there. I had to I had to do some digging myself, so it's it's not straightforward, perhaps. So since kindling is not applicable, you know, we can't torch stuff and have it come on fire. So if if it's dry, theoretically, what what does the dryness or wetness do to the environment? Is it just historical? Because who cares if it's historical, right? It has to have a game impact. You know? Does anybody have any have any 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 concepts on what the dryness might create in this scenario, however slight? How do we start fires in this scenario other than kindling? The mortars, maybe. Yeah. Even that seems like a stretch. Right? The mortars. Because that's the only thing that like blows stuff. The rest of it is just infantry fire. Infantry fire doesn't cause fires unless they're huts, right? Unless it's like PTO. And uh but it's not PTO, right? Because this is a ETO. So that is sort of one thing we don't look up. So if you guys if you guys have a pocket rule book. If you do, and if you don't, you could probably look at your electronic rule book. And this is why I like this particular infantry fire tail with the A7 that's on your back, your pocket rule book, uh, with all the stars and dots and stuff like that. Uh, the only impact that I know of that dryness would come into play is if you get a critical hit on, if either side gets a critical hit on their mortars. So yeah, they'd have to roll a snake eye. Yeah, they'd have to roll a yeah. snake eyes to hit which would generate the critical hit, right? Because that's the only way to get it on a, an area target type mortar. You'd have to roll snake eyes to hit. And then you'd also have to roll a snake eyes on your resolution. Because the resolution is the double red star. If you look on the, it doesn't have your, on your normal infantry fire chart. It has on the back of this one here. Um, uh, the orange, what's on the back of my book. It's also in your, uh, flip, in your flip charts or whatever. Uh, it's really, it's really yeah, useful. The rat chart. The rat chart. Do the rat charts have it? Yeah, on the back of the latest version of the rat chart. Oh right. They've got, they've got the uh, specific. They've got a, a modified IFT, with basically designed for flame rubble, etc. Et yeah, that one's a really good one because, in my opinion, I pretty much think that that particular IFT kind of sums up how to create rubble, how to create flame, stuff like that without having to read 15 pages worth of rules, to be honest. Yeah. If it occurs on this, if it, most of these are original dice rules. If, if it occurs on this, then you read the little dot down here and it kind of summarizes it. And then you go on your merry way instead of having to dictate the rules. So I really like that particular thing. So that's, that's the one I'm referring to. Yeah. I, I, I just don't want to be 
working through a rule book. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that's what the charts are for anyway, right? Quick, quick reference. So we get a snake eyes, did a crit, and then we also get a resolution, which is usually going to kill the guy. But that leads to a, like if you read the thing, it says original HE heat effects, which the mortars are HE, dice roll, the original dice roll causes a possible flame creation. And it's a subsequent dice roll plus the environmental c conditions, which in this case, dry, I think is minus one. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, plus, no, no, it says a plus one. So you would add that. And if it's greater than the kindling number, then the flame would occur. So these players here have actually put the dry on there. So it has the EC plus one. So you don't have to look it up, but very dry plus two. I think white's like minus two, something like that. So if you were to, were to get a crit, you'd have to roll snake eyes and another snake eyes. Then you would roll a possible flame, which is like a kindling number. And uh, if you look on your kindling charts, so if you, if you should get so lucky to do that, or, or if the dice happen to pop that way, you could look at your kindling chart here. And, you know, if you get crits, if you, if that occurs, if the possible flame occurs, we don't really have, uh, we have brush. So brush, you would need an eight because it's plus one. The kindling is nine. Stone building, funny thing is, is it kindles not too difficult. It kindles on an eight, which means if you critted a, a stone building, it would kindle on a seven here because of the dry. Well, the, dry, the EC don't apply to buildings, actually. So you would still need an eight. And then a wooden building, seven, cacti, you know, cactus. Grain is pretty high to, to, to kindle, but it will spread. You would need a nine for that overall. And then that's about, that's about it. So woods is, woods is down here. You would need an eight for a woods. So like an eight, eight, nine, eight or nine on average after the snake eyes, you'd have to roll greater than the Kindle number. So you'd have to roll greater than eight or nine and you could possibly cause a flame. Will it make a great impact in this scenario? I got. I don't think so. Simply because um, it's uh, both sides are moving, whether they're routing backwards involuntarily, or they're just going towards the victory conditions. And um, so the the occurrence of that actually impacting uh, would be very very low. You might have a possible flame. Uh, there is no wind, but it could happen. You know, different. I mean, first turn if you get a crit on a guy. In the first unit, let's say behind the lines, 10 hexes away, like you see on the map here. If you see it in the second cops of wood, giant woods in the center of the map, if you get a you know possible flame erupting on the first turn, by the time the poles get there, you know that might split that woods in half to make some guys go left or right. That could make an impact on the poles movement. I don't really think it will impact the Germans that much, but it, you know it could impact the uh, the poles movement. Plus, again smoke for last sight so anyway that's uh too much time spent on something that will probably never ever happen but anytime you see dry you have to ask yourself why is it dry instead of just moderate you know what what what's the difference and that's the only difference i could see and as steve pointed out the mortars the mortars is what the only thing that's going to generate that and uh and again the scenario doesn't tell you that you have to kind of ask yourself why would they put dry in there why would they, why do they care? And so, um, even without the dry, you can still have those fires. It's just that the possible flame creation won't cause a little higher. So, uh, whatever. That's, we'll just go on to number two, Polish elite and first line units of assault fire capability. Um, with fours, it's not that big a deal. One squad's not going to make a difference, uh, because the firepower will be three in the advanced fire phase of the normal range, as long as you could apply the uh, assault fire capability. Unlike your, your German 548s or units with five firepower and have assault firepower, uh, they will have a four in the advanced fire phase. But at what point does the assault fire make a difference to the poles in this particular scenario? How can they take advantage of the assault fire? Well, because they're on the attack, they're going to be moving. So, so they're, they're definitely going to be need to maximize the use of the salt fire because it is an advantage. So multi-location fire groups of two or more squads. Right. So, cause one squad only gives you three, two will give you six and three will give you nine. So one squad does nothing, but if you go two, that will give you that next extra next column. And so as the poles move, 
Uh, as the Polish player, you want at least your uh, squads to stick together, um, even if there's a half squad, because um, you need two units in proximity to one another to take benefit of it. So if you have a full squad and a half squad, the half squad will advance fire at half firepower, of course. He'll have one, and then the uh, full squad will have three, and then added with the half squad, will make at least a four. So at least you're still getting benefit from that. Um, two squads will be six, which even be better, and so on and so forth. But essentially, a single Polish squad by himself essentially loses that advantage of assault fire because it won't add up to anything unless you're playing IIFT, and I don't, and so it does nothing for me. Um, so that's one thing to think about if you're the Polish player. Of course, you've got 11 units. Uh, density of units on essentially 10 map going through like that is usually pretty decent. So you're most likely going to be adjacent to someone that you could fire with. But sometimes you might not be. But take into account if you are moving away from essentially your center, center units, maybe stick at least a half squad with a full squad to gain that, to not lose that. Essentially, it's a minus one, right? So if you're either going from a three chart to a four chart and considering everything's either hindered or just woods, uh, you're essentially negating the defense's uh, TEM. You know, a four plus one versus a two plus one is a big difference percentage-wise on the on the chart. You know, four plus one, you need a six for a pin task check or a five for a normal morale check and that's not too difficult those are pretty common rolls to be honest with you so as the poles you want to make sure you got two guys maybe not stacked together depending on what you want to do or at least close proximity so you guys could take advantage of that so it's tough to do but you gotta you gotta finagle with it uh the third one is just polish multi-man counters broken morale increased by one um that's just to, I just, just represent, you know, I guess in, in, enhanced abilities, you know, uh, I think a pull it in flames has the backside as normal. So, uh, again, something to take and something to try to remember, make sure you increase their, their morales by one. Again, uh, some people might've substituted out the poles from the allied miners in this one. Um, just keep in mind that the, the, the broken morale level, this was probably created before. Uh, I wouldn't use Poland and Flames counters. I would use whatever counters that the uh, scenario suggests, which would be Allied Miner in this case, just in case you know a third party might give the give their nationalities uh, different abilities. So the, the this one here, as you see, I think they started the prep fire. They started the uh, log just a little late, so we have a broken unit in the front, and uh, and we could tell. Two, three, four, five. Actually, we can't tell. So right now, the Germans started with six concealments uh, to begin the game with. And um, we don't know, uh, well, we do know, if what certain units would have gained those, would have started with those concealments. Uh, all the units on the bottom here, the unit in J3 behind the wall, the unit up top in J10, because all these units have LOS to an enemy unit. Assuming this is the, the this is a prep fire, so so those are the concealments. The one in uh, J seven is most likely was gained pregame um, after the setup, and uh, I'm presuming that the units in the I row for the Germans had the other two, three, four, five. At least one of those probably had another concealment. Again, I see a lone LMG in I seven. Uh, don't know if that was, that may have been a CR unit or something like that. I don't see any counters marked out here. Uh, I think they might, um, fix that. And again, no Polish units have any, uh, concealments on them because they're all in LOS to a, a known, well, actually not even known, just an enemy unit. So not sure which one's fired. So we're just going to continue from here. So, um, one thing of note as the Germans. Um, you have the floating MMG and you have two light machine guns. Um, so with those weapons, again, how, how would you best use those weapons in this one here? You see long avenues approach. You want to stop the poles trying to get to the town or killing your guys. And so 
when I see especially a disparity between the light machine guns between the Axis and the Allies, they only have a single medium machine gun, the Poles. And the Germans have three machine guns. And even though there are two of them are lights, they can cause a big problem. And so fire lanes is probably what you're going to be looking at in any scenario where you usually say, hey, that seems to be a lot of machine guns around. And you're usually outnumbered. So uh, fire lanes can be a very good benefit, assuming you can uh, protect the fire lane firer and uh, have decent fire lanes to um, to operate through. So we'll see that in the beginning of this particular game. And so we'll see the big difference of what the fire lane will do. So I'm just going to step through. Any questions so far? Uh, the OBs are pretty standard. We got a hero. We'll cover the hero uh, mid-game. and um, But pretty much it's a uh, get to the back. And uh, you'll see commonalities in the setups here. Uh, the G-Row is where the Germans can set up on the on, the, on this game, the right-hand side. I'm not sure anybody would set up uh, sort of in the center part. I guess you could. But um, mostly everyone either sets up on the bottom or just in that copse of trees. Uh, I, I, hopefully we'll get to a discussion where, um, as we see between the three games, compare, comparing different setup areas and things like that. I even had a thought about my game afterwards. And uh, even though it doesn't look obvious, I think there's a much better spot for some of the German units. Because the Germans aren't going to be defeating the Poles straight up. And again, if the Germans lose units, that's what the Poles do. The Poles don't need to get to the village, right? The Poles don't need to get to the village. They just need to kill six Germans. That's it. Six Germans, six German squad equivalents. So that's most of them. But as you'll see... That happens pretty fast. The primary thing that you have to worry about in the Germans here, and you'll see it if you can see the different avenues. What's the biggest thing the Germans have to worry about in this scenario, in my opinion? Or this is what I'm thinking about. What's the biggest thing they have to do? The Poles are punching them in the face, breaking them. And what what do the Germans have to watch out for? The biggest failure to route. Failure out or rough hazard or cut, and as you see on the map, where where the where the trouble spots for the Germans? You guys could click your red circles on the map if you want. That that cops where he's got the uh, where yep. he's got the a lot of troops set up already. But right, there's no route path. Right, there's it's no covered route path. Yeah, exactly. The K one area and, and essentially any of those gaps, any of these gaps is bad and look at this guy up here what do you think about this guy up here the first thing i think about what do you think is i think about tell me you're a sacrificial half squad yeah this guy's this guy's dead if he's a half squad that's one half point to the germans if a full squad it's a full point this is a free unit for the poles especially if you got something like this because again the germans are going to withdraw so even if all of these guys get back here, this guy, the the uh, poles on the right-hand side here will advance up. Whether they go here or across here, depends on what the poles want to do, right? But this guy's not going anywhere without getting shot at a minus two. I mean, he could assault move here or advance phase into K-10. But, you know, then again, you don't have any cover from that. Uh, he'd be better served in L-10 because... Uh, L10, unless he's strictly for firing on these hexes, which you could cover that from uh, different angles, um, a unit in L10 or M10 can cover, still cover the road approach over here. But again, that's maybe that's uh, a ploy. If you want to bring some some Polish over there to deal with that guy, maybe it relieves pressure from somewhere else. Again, but for defensive wise, this guy's not not going anywhere, most likely. And if he does break, you don't have a leader to rally him. And that's what the Polish have. They have numbers to chase guys down with. And you see down the bottom right, there are four half squads here. They're good to chase. Well, he's like five. Yeah, he's got five because he starts with one. So he's got five half squads that can just run past units and chase them down, which makes it difficult for the Germans to survive routing. There are some unique route paths in this game, although it looks like a basic 
map and basic systems, you'll see some, I'll stop at the routes and we'll figure out where these guys can route to. And both sides have unique route paths. And this is what we have to look at, especially in ASL, how it differs from starter kit. This is where, this is where the games are different, right? And, and this game is exemplary of that. Whereas in starter kit, you don't have a problem. You just route back. You keep routing back. You keep routing back. No problems here. And this game is a very good example of what happens when you start adding rules like surrender into play. Your forces dis... Just, just, Go ahead. Just, just as a thing, regarding the, the Polish OB, a big giveaway that you want to be deploying at the start, your, your maximum is the fact that they've given you an additional half squad. That's a hint. Yeah. From a designer. So when you see someone gives you an extra half squad, rather than just squads, they're assuming that a, a average to good player is going to deploy up to the max because you will need to deploy. Right. And that, that's the hint that you need to deploy in this game. Right. And then, and if you got, you, and look at the disparity between the leaders. The Germans have an 8 1, 8 0, pretty much the same style of leader. And the other one's a 9 1, 7 0. So the 9 1 is probably going to be the guy that's going to be taken, you know, he's going to be in the, in, in a middle area or something like that, hopefully surviving any sort of defensive fire. The 7 0 is going to be the pickup or the moving the MMG, possibly. I mean, you could theoretically put the 237 with the MMG. Just to, I mean, think about if you put the MMG in F4, you know, if it goes one down, if you put it here, all he has to do is sit there for these units here and just continually drop a fire lane down here. And again, that's somebody pointed that out. This is going to be a tough spot for the Germans to leave. And that's what I, that's what I figured out too late in my game where these units down here are very similar to the unit up top. That's this exact same position as the unit up top. It's just a bigger copse of trees. But these guys aren't getting past here without getting shot in the open. They're either going to have a zero TEM for when they assault move there or advance phase there at the end of a game turn. Or the poles are going to pounce on them. The poles have a decent range of five. And the medium can, you know, reach out and touch someone down there. And uh, it makes it difficult for the Germans. And the other thing the Germans have to watch out for is let's say you do get here and you break. You're not going very far in your route destinations and you're stopping. And at that point, these little mongrel half squads then do what they're designed to do is surround and capture you. So even if you do break and you get here, you're not going to rally fast because those are exposed positions. And then the pol the poles, if they fire on you again, just give you an opportunity to rot back. And you'll see a lot of the poles in various games, they won't do that. They'll, they might DM you, but again, based on the positioning, uh, might force you down. Like if you're broken here, they might force you down to this location. And then once you're on the sides, the last spot you want to be as a broken unit is on the side of a board. That is the last spot you want to be. You know, better to be in the middle and die and surrender because most of the time the middle is where all the action is. So people are moving. So more likely you're going to be blocking movement, things like that. If you're on the side, it's a much easier to, to get rid of you on the side. Um, uh, and, uh, just realize that when, when you, when your units are broken, you know, this is a decision that you have to take when you're low crawling. If I low crawl one heck, sure. I don't take interdiction, but am I gone during his next, if his next movement phase is coming up, right? If it's his turn coming up and you low crawl in the open and he's two hexes away and you've got no one to protect that unit, he's, he's gone. That full squad is gone. You might as well take interdiction. And even if you fail it, which is it? You have actually a really good success chance, even with a six bra unit. That's not too bad. Uh, it's like about like 40% or something like that to survive that interdiction. Sure, you might get pinned, but you were going to low crawl anyway. So consider, especially, I mean, sure, you might lose a half squad, but if you stay there, you know, reevaluate. If I low crawl, is it my turn coming up or is it his turn coming up? Can I move guys, come, can I move guys up to defend that unit? Or is he going to move and just surround him anyway? And if the answer is he's just going to surround them anyway, you might as well try and take interdiction. So that's my opinion. That's my thoughts on, on interdicting and things like that. And, um, you know, SK play, I know a lot of people here from SK and things like that, or have played SK. 
that's what that's what we're dealing with here and that's the difference is that um we want to we want to get rid of from the from the sk we want to get rid of that low crawl mentality of every time yes you're you are alive for that one phase but you're dead because you low crawled the next turn the next player turn and uh you'll 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 see that as a recurring theme in many of the games or in any of the games for that matter you know whether you're an sk player or an asl player some asl players do not want to make that morale check and um even with eight morale units and uh uh otherwise you're just gone and uh, we'll see examples of that I'll, we'll, we'll try to point them out and uh Again, most likely, I'm just I'm not really going to focus on whether these guys are doing the right thing or not. I'm focusing on good choices, you know. Not it's not maybe a good thing, but it's such a good choice, you know. And then route paths, and uh, because this one's so big in route paths, it's uh, something to focus on. And dice rolls are just again dice rolls for me. I'll reiterate a thousand times are just dice rolls. You know, I lost a game because I rolled snake eyes uh, three times in a row for morale checks. I literally lost the game for that. And, um, because guess what? All my guys went, went berserk. And, um, so snake eyes isn't always the best thing that you're, that you're dealing with. And, um, so whether you're rolling bad or whether you're rolling higher or lower, it doesn't matter. You know, a three on a morale check is the same thing as a seven on morale check. If you just need to roll below your morale to be good. If I have eight morale unit, a three is exactly the same thing as an eight. Same result. So even though it's lower. And, you know, it, the, the seven could have helped them the entire time. And, uh, and that's, again, that's where your, your assault fire and, and making, take, making sure you take advantage of your assault fire whenever possible, that extra one level morale check, right? Say, say you rolled it on the lower chart because you couldn't use your assault fire. If you are always trying to get that assault fire into play and all you, sometimes you can't always do it many times that small percentage of eight to ten percent on the chart could make the difference between normal we're well, only looking at a difference between normal morale check and a one morale check i don't care about two morale checks k's k2s i'm just looking to see if you can improve the normal morale check by one because that's going to essentially approve your results by like 10 or 15 percent which is great and when you're dealing with 10 shots i mean how many shots do we take during a game and if 10 percent of those shots yielded a better result you know probably you know 20 percent of the opponent's morale checks he would have failed because of that extra one morale check the other all the ones he would have passed regardless you know he would have rolled the threes on those so making sure you take advantage of what you have in your ob what you have in the scenario special rules is how you is how you most likely will come out ahead you know if you have a great ob but yet you don't take advantage of certain things. Don't take advantage of your smoke. Don't take advantage of your mortars. Don't take advantage of fire lanes, possibilities, and things like that. Figure out where your opponent needs to be and counter that move. Again, fire lanes, pause, great. If the medium goes down here to this woods, does that help us? Sure. He could set a fire lane down here for when the Germans are in the center area. It really kind of counters the German move there. And then if he's also bringing guys up top, he just has regular infantry fire up there. You're essentially trying to funnel the Germans. And even though, you know, fire lanes go long distance, you know, 11 for the, for the Polish medium, 12 for the German medium, you know, and, uh, and you'll see different places for the medium here. The medium is just a wild card. It's how you kind of want to conduct it. Can the medium right here on the steeple, can he generate a fire lane in his present position? An R3. No. No. Nah, not at ground level, right? Correct. Yeah. So he can't... He's he's firing a one hex and one hex only in this particular situation, which is fine. If that's his plan, it looks like he's going to defend these hexes here. Any movement over here, nothing's wrong with that. That's his choice. And it's in a safe spot. Most likely, they're not going to fire back out of there. They have better targets to shoot at. So the medium is safe and it does have potential for a fire lane late game. If he doesn't move at all, he drops down to bottom level and he could do a straight fire lane or, or one that goes up to the top. Those are different. Uh, those are percent possibilities that this player might be thinking about. So, or dropping back or doing whatever he wants to do, right? He could, he could move up to P4 
and drop a fire lane up that direction if necessary, depending on what the poles do. So this is a safe position for the medium. It's probably more of a reactionary spot. So, um, so you could you could put that thing in any number of places. Hell, you could put it up here, and you'll see the difference what we, what we see here. So, uh, again, the dice rolls. I'm not going to really worry about too much. I'm going to pop through here. Looks like he's prepping again. Again, I'm not sure what happened up here, so we're just going to pick it up from right here. So lots of Germans are breaking, and then we're going to go through the movement phase. You see the half squads coming first because these guys are broken up front. And look what we have right at the beginning. We've got a fire lane, half squad, fire lane, shoots up top. So he drops that fire lane. That's a good solid fire lane. Very solid. Covers all the open ground areas right here. And he's shooting it first, right? We don't want to, we don't want our last shot to be a fire lane because it does nothing. He shoots it first on this unit. So this initial shot is going to be what against this 237? I've, I've, there's been a lot of questions on fire lanes and what modifiers apply and things like that throughout the games um, so far in the war. And so this is just one instance where we have to, we, where we could discuss how a fire lane operates and what effects we're looking at. So the initial shot is what on the 237 from that unit down there in the bottom? I'd call it a two up one, assuming it's, you know, non-assault movement. Right, right. And yeah, yeah I think he, I think he hightailed it back here. Two up yeah. one. How'd you get the two up one, Steve? Well, he's shooting through the two hindrances. All right. So that's a plus two. Grain, right. And then the non-assault movement takes it down one. All right. So the initial shot is two up one, drops a fire lane. So and then uh, I don't think he gets a result. I don't think he gets a positive result. Nothing happens there. He does. He This unit drops a shot here. These are residual. Now, what happens if another unit enters that location? Another Polish unit goes there. What, how, how would you resolve that? How would you resolve that? Because you have the fire lane and then you have the other residual firepower. How do you think you guys would resolve that? Would you trump one over the other? other? Or would you um, ignore one? Would you add them together? Would that be a two firepower chart? How would you guys no, resolve? They don't get combined. I can't say I know if there's a sequence they should go in, but I don't think they can combine. Right. So uh, when you have the when you have a fire lane uh, overlapping with a regular residual firepower, let me see. There is a, there is a an order you go through. One has to go first. I think the regular goes first. Is always traced. Well, I'm just going to say the uh, existing, I'm just going to say the existing residual goes first. I can look at a player. I don't want to waste any time. But one will go before the other. I'm pretty sure it's the regular residual firepower because if this fire lane rolls a 12, then it will malfunction. So to preclude that, I think the system gives the defensive player the benefit and whatever existing firepower, residual firepower is, is, is there first. So if the 457 were to move there, he'd incur, he'd incur a one firepower and what would dice roll modifiers would apply to that if the four five seven moves into h7 what what would be the result if he if he what would be the attack if he moved into that location is he being attacked which i'm sorry which residual is he being attacked by uh the first one the the residual the one residual the uh, one that's in the hex. Again, if it's not assault movement, it'd be a one down two. Right. He would be a one down two. And then let's say he survives that attack. What happens with the fire lane? What would be the attack on the fire lane? I think the same. One down two. The fire lane in this case, would it be different? And why would it be different? I don't know. Anybody could chime in. Only if the... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Pete. Only if the uh, hindrance is a hard hindrance, not a soft hindrance. Right. And this is where the, it will differ between the fire lanes and the residual firepower. Uh, the placed residual firepower in hex, the in hex residual firepower based on IFT attack or whatever, it already takes into account any residuals 
outside the hex, smoke, walls, whatever. So that is full one firepower. And then whatever the TEM of the hex is, all those modifiers apply. The fire lanes, on the other hand, differ. And this is what makes them very powerful. Uh, the fire lane, because it goes through these hindrances here, the initial shot was one plus or two plus two like we had before, right? And so when he drops the fire lane, okay, now what are the effects of that? Well, if the attack, <clears throat> in this case, it had gone through these soft hindrances, and those are defined in the uh, index, soft, and then a hard hindrance would be the crag or orchard. So the soft hindrances, in this case, what they what they do is they simply negate the first fire movement in the open. So if this unit non-assault moved into this one on its destination to go across there, or if he dashed across the road, the attack would be exactly the same. It's going to be a one residual firepower, right, from the fire lane. The dash will have no effect on the fire lane. Because you know, it's already down, the initial shot, it doesn't matter. The fire lane is there. So, but because of the, 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 the soft hindrance is here, it will negate the FFMO. So that'd be a one down one, which is still a decent attack. If one of these were crag, or if just say, if, if a fire lane, like I threw in going through P6 to I10, and it would go through the crag, the crag will add one to the dice roll modifier. So in that case, if, if, uh, one of these were crag and the other one didn't exist in h4 h5 so if there's only one crag then that would be a plus one to the die roll and that would negate the ffmo and that would balance out with the non-assault movement so if one of those is a hard hindrance and the other one didn't exist in h4 h5 that would be a one even shot since it's a soft hindrance it just negates the ffmo your ff nam still applies so there'd be a one minus one. And if neither of those hindrances is there, we would one, one minus two. So that's what we're looking at in terms of fire lane application. Now the differences occur where if there were two crags, if both of H4 and H5 are crags or orchard in this case, then each of those terrains would add one to the modifier. So if you, these were orchards, That'd be a plus two to the attack. And so the FF move in the open would be negated. The non-assault move would be countered by one of the hard hindrances and the other hard hindrances would make that a plus one. So if H4 and H5 were hard hindrances, both, then this unit crossing that, whether he's dashing or simply moving, he would receive a plus one modifier going in the open across that because of the hard hindrances. So that's something that you need to wrap your head around, um, go over some of the examples in the book uh, and understand the, the terminology between hard and soft hindrances. Look in your, I looked in my um, electronic rule book. It has the definitions of those there. So that's something that you'll wanna read and understand. Um, I don't think they had them there necessarily before historically. And so you'd have to read them, you know, decipher them in the rule book. So that was a common occurrence. But that's what we're looking at here is with the fire lane. And that's what makes the fire lanes very strong. Now, if you had a unit down below, say F3, say he moves to G3 and he moves to H3, what would the fire attack be there? Let's just say this. I'm just going to clone this guy. Let's say this unit moves here and then he moves here. And he enters the fire lane. What would the what would the fire attack be on that unit? What would the IFT be on that unit? I don't think that's a one down two, right? Yes, really that is a right. one down two. Yes. On the, yeah, because the hindrances aren't there to okay. Right. So the shot hasn't gone through the hindrances yet. This guy's just exposed. So this guy's going to take a one down two. This guy's going to take a one up one after the other guy moves through. And again, if those were hard, both these were hard, that'd be a one up two. So you got a one down two to a one up two in the same fire lane. So those are things you have to take advantage of as an attacker and a defender, right? So like, say this, say this road wasn't here. 
and sometimes it might not even make a difference in the Q1 orchard sort of road, right? If you had a machine gun in V3 and that road didn't exist in that array of orchards and you had a unit down here and you wanted to fire a fire lane down through here, let's say the fire lane was there already and then this unit moves right here. The fire lane from V3 to off the board. What would that modifier be modified by? What would that attack be modified by? Let's say it's a LMG fire lane. Those are all hard hindrances. So this would not be an open ground. That there'd be no FFMO because the hard hindrances or the general hinge, soft hindrances will negate the first fire move in the open. The non-assault movement would apply. So we get a minus one from that, but you have four hard hindrances. So that would add four to the dice roll. So essentially this unit moving, moving in the open into a fire lane from V3 to P0 or beyond, and this is not a road, then that would be essentially a stone building he's entering. You know, that would be essentially a stone building. So you probably don't want to drop your fire lanes through a lot of hard hindrances. One's fine. You know, you might fire, you know, a guy from Q9 down through here. That might be okay, but you still have the one hard hindrance. But if, if I mean, it's a one, a one even is much better than a one plus four. So, and uh, take that into account, especially, you know, we had strayer strays. I think we played last year or something like that. Um, take advantage of the orchard. If someone goes, shoots at you with a machine gun, who cares? they're not going to drop a fire lane because it's going to be completely ineffective. Most likely it's going to be completely ineffective. You know, unless it's like a six firepower. But then again, those are extremely rare. So fire lanes, that's how we're going to resolve the fire lanes in this instance. And you'll see the effectiveness of this guy's, of this guy's fire lane. So two, three, seven moves here, takes a shot. <clears throat> that's going to be a one even shot because uh, uh, I assume he's assault moving. And guess what? James gets a roll. Remember, these are free attacks on the IFT. And that's why you drop fire lanes. You, so you can get free attacks. The Germans are outnumbered. You only get one shot. If they get one shot and done, the poles just run by them. But look, free attack breaks. Next unit moves. They move up. Another guy moves. Not assault movement. Free attack. Rolls another four. Breaks. All right? He already fired. This guy's essentially made three fire infantry fire attacks. And so what does that do to the poles? For me, you know, if all my guys are breaking up there, you know, how many more guys, how many more bodies are you gonna throw in there? If they all break, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. So that might stifle their the attack. And that's again, that's why you need to drop the fire lane early. So he has to make a decision. If all of his guys are going through, then he'll take more chances. But if all of these guys break, now look look what happened to all these guys. These guys are stuck. He stayed. These guys stayed. You know, of course, you know, you're staring some of these other guys in the face, but that's beside the point. He, he probably wanted to defend the, the stone building, and that's exactly what the player did. And we just go through a couple of attacks. We got some mortar shots. And of course, we get a sniper here. And lo and behold, our sniper takes out our eight minus one leader, and the unit with the mortar breaks. So that's unfortunate. So we do a lot, we got a lot of red dots going around. I think this is the defensive fire phase. Uh, okay, oh, here we go. We're going to the route phase now. So this is the route phase. So the poles have made, you know, gone up a hex or two. Very conservative. We got to jump the big mortar up top. He actually got pinned, so he actually can't move. We got some advanced fire here. Stack of units could be dangerous. You know, take a four plus one later, whatever you want to do. So we're looking at routing. Let's look at this unit in particular right here in H5. Doesn't make a, a difference overall, but it does make a minor difference. So where does that unit, first of all, does that unit have to route? The broken unit in H5, does he have to route? Yes. Why does he have to route? He's adjacent to a known enemy unit. Right. A good order enemy unit. Correct. Right. It's because if this guy was broken, he wouldn't have to route. 
So he's got to route. And because it's the Polish turns, they have to route first. So what would his destination be? What, what's the closest cover in movement factors that he has to try to attempt to reach in this, in this game, in this route phase? And anybody could chime in. Anybody could chime in. This is what we're here for. We're here to try and figure out where this guy can route. Call it F5. F5? Okay. How did you, how'd you, how'd you arrive at F5 versus F4 versus G8? G8. Well, I just said F5 because it's two hexes away and he could, I don't know if he can get there through the open ground. Depending on if anybody can interdict them, it would only be three to get there as opposed to F4 would be the extra half to go through the grain. And he might not even be able to go that way because I don't know if that's a real unit that might stop him from routing to F4 anyway. Right, right. So let, look a little lower. This is, this is a very special case. Very special case. Is this unit real down on the bottom, G1? I'm presuming it is. Because they the Germans only got six, it, uh, it could be a dummy unit. I don't know, right? So the question you have to self: Does the German think that he has LOS to this unit? Do you guys think the German has LOS from G one to H five? No, I didn't see the woods in G three, so I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's got LOS. Yeah, where's it going to bisect, Pete? Where's the LOS going to bisect uh, the hex side? Uh, that. Uh, about halfway through the H3 hex side. Right, right here. It's going to bisect right there. So you only have to try to trace line of sight from G1 to this subs to that hex half that way and the hex side, and it's clear to H5. That's your basic geometry of ASL, and that's short range. The short range ones are real easy to do. So G1's got a clear line of sight. Is, Sorry, go ahead. The other thing is that that wood is quite small. Yes. It doesn't go right to the edge. Yeah, it's not like There's quite a lot of room. Yeah, it's not like H1 who's kind of big and fat. Yeah, when you see something like this, pretty much you got a you clear line of sight past it most of the time. So this is what this is what you have to do is both attacker and a defender. Steve is right. The F5 is closest, not in hexes. Don't don't think about routing in hexes whatsoever. Typically, it's a lot of guys think it's hexes, but in this, and especially in this case, this case. It's all about movement factors. And Steve said, right, it's three movement factors there. So a lot of times there might be a, a, a train, a woods or building, like say in G5, but if that's up a hill, right, if G5 were on level one and a woods, would he route to G5 or would he route to F5? He'd route to F5 still because that's three movement factors away. Up the, up the hill into the woods or building is four movement factors. So this is not a destination that this unit could route to, you know? So we have it's, to- It's not It's not, not his designated route destination yet. Right, it's not the closest in, in movement factors. It's closest movement factors. So now he can get to that location in any way he wishes. You know, as long as he tries to get there and it doesn't violate any of the other routing rules. Like, I don't think that he sees this unit here so he can either go to g5 to there because he can reach it right that's three moon factors or he can go to g or g6 rather or g5 and there and that would be three and a half moon factors now would that be create a problem with the unit h1 could he route to g5 does h1 pose a problem to that broken unit no okay because he's maintaining the uh, same distance from right four four getting closer right four hexes away one two three four and that's he shot at him with four now uh if the german unit were to drop this concealment would that change any result in that unit's routing would that change him from using g5 yeah he couldn't use g5 because that would be getting closer to this unit right and then, so therefore, he'd have to use G6. What happens when he uses G6 now? Because that's the only legal route path to F5. Well, he could potentially expose himself to interdiction, though I'm not sure in this case he would. He surrenders. 
Right. Why does he surrender, Pete? Because he's adjacent to a good order enemy unit. And the only available route path is in open ground. He has to route through open ground in the line of sight of a a good order enemy unit. An interdictable location, right? He could be interdicted in G6. Yeah. yeah. And and if the only option for him to traverse this hit and not be interdicted is low crawl, he still has to surrender. Right. So the difference between this unit on the bottom of being keeping his concealment or not decides the fate of this unit straight off. Now, who interdicts the guy in G6? This guy at the top. Exactly. You just saw that. Yep. Exactly. That's what we're looking at. That's the routes that we're looking at. This unit's serving a huge purpose because now he can interdict every single one of these hexes. So if any of these guys is adjacent to a German unit that breaks, they will surrender. Remember, the adjacency is the issue. He will then yeah. surrender to this 247 because he can't go to G5 on his way to F5. He'd have to go to, he has to go to G6. That is the only path that he could take there. And that's why before you move, you've got to be aware of the consequences if things go wrong. Right. Now, this unit's clean, yeah. right? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't think like that, unfortunately. Yeah, but you know, obviously, you know, this unit up here creates this problem here. But again, if this guy's not going to reveal, then he gets to he could route through that location. And he has to reveal before the guy makes his first movement. Right, but yeah, but he could reveal. Like, yeah, I won't go into that the other spot. But but yeah, so essentially, this looks like a very 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 simple route. He just goes back to the woods, right? Just I just go back to the woods. I'm going to stack with my leader, do whatever, and just nonchalantly do what I need to do. But there's a lot of things going on here, and this is why I always focus on routing. You know, this guy's this guy's safe. He just goes straight back because he's increasing the distance of everybody down below. He's not getting close to anybody up above, and he's going through terrain that's not interdictable. Very safe location. This one is not necessarily safe. If that's a full squad. I, pr- I would probably reveal myself and have him surrender and maybe even reject at this point. Okay. Let's say, let's take a look based upon the victory conditions, gentlemen. Let's say that's a full squad or a half squad and you have a regular squad here. No one's going to jump in close combat yet. So would it, uh, does it help the Germans if we have prisoners in this game? What's the benefit to the Germans if we have prisoners? The obvious benefit is what? The obviously benefit of taking prisoners is what? Getting guys out of the battle, right? Yep. They can't rally, can't do shit, it's half squad. You know, it won't even affect our firepower if we capture them. So his firepower won't be affected. Uh, probably don't want to break. But at this point, it doesn't cost that 247 any firepower. And so, not a problem. But do the Germans really need or want or desire prisoners in this game? Well, if they start accumulating prisoners, their firepower starts to become affected. Therefore, they can't shoot at these guys that could be running by them. And therefore, they can't either defend themselves or get back or stop the Polish from getting to the buildings in the back. Which is honestly a secondary obje- objective in the game. So in my opinion, I don't think the Germans... It doesn't really behoove them too much unless there were a stack of units here, right? If there were two squads here, oh, you definitely take surrender because all of them would surrender at one time. And so you get them and then you can no quarter later on. But if the Germans evoke no quarter, it really doesn't harm them too much. Yes, the the uh, the opposing player can attempt to rally them later on. But again, what are your what's, what's your enemy's leadership? He's got a 9-1. Is he going to be staying in the back rallying? Possibly, right? And he's got a 7-0. He has two leaders. And at this point right now, one of them's broken. You know, somebody smacked that thing, that the heck's pretty good. Everything's broken and wounded. And the other leader, oh, the other one's right back here. So both of his leaders are in the same proximity. So if anybody up top gets broken, they're going to stay broken. But guys up top, if they break, and he's got half, almost half his force up there, if they're broken, they're staying broken the whole game. And then, and there's gonna be hard for them goes those guys to come back. So your just your decision whether to take this guy prisoner, um, 
I would lean probably a little bit more more towards maybe capture maybe capture the first guy up to your unit size number because he's probably going to have to shoot at you later anyway, and most likely he'll just kill the prisoners, his own prisoners. But sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. But no quarter is not a bad deal. Now on the reverse side, do the prisoners help the Polish? And based upon the victory conditions, prisoners do help, whether they're eliminated or captured. Now, they don't count double because it just says squad equivalents eliminated or captured, not, you know, catch the, the doubling is the casualty victory points. There are no casualty victory points awarded here. It's just squad, equivalent, squad equivalents eliminated or captured. So it does behoove the, um, the Polish to capture them because if the Polish declared no quarter, then the Germans will always low crawl and route away. Yes, it still might cause a destruction if they take interdiction, but at least you give them a chance. Where in this case, and you'll see that the more prisoners the Polish can obtain, the easier it is to, to, to obtain. They're attaining their victory objective. That's a victory objective. If the Poles declare no quarter, they're fighting against, the, they're hurting themselves in this game. They want to capture the Germans, right? So if they declare no quarter, that's a big, big blunder based upon the victory conditions. Right. Secondly, because if you if you keep the ability to take prisoners, it's a free deployment. And in the late game, that becomes very important. Right. Just as the Poles had two other squads deployed in the beginning, exact same thing. Deploy the squad. And he did it up here. I think he did it... Um, he does, it, he does it later on. Yeah, maybe he does it later. He captures somebody, does it later on. Um, so yeah, you deploy, you still have half squad. He can move forward, and that guy could just be the reservoir of, of broken units. But so, the other thing is you've only got two leaders. So you're not going to be able to, you, you, your leaders are going to want to be rallying. Right. Keep moving forward. Trying to deploy, because you can, can't do both. Right. So in this situation, in this game right here, the Germans lost his eight minus one right here, and... The Polish has their nine minus one, nine minus one out of commission here. So uh, both sides have lost a leader. So rally is very key in this one here. So um, anyway, well, let's go with continue with the route. And um, he 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 advan he routes here and then he routes here, which again, oop, let's see, let me. He routes there and then he routes to this location here, which again technically he has to go here. So not a big deal. Things like that happen. Can he go here anyway? Because he ended here. Could he have made it there anyway? Could he have made it to this thing if he if because the path that he took was not the correct path? But could he have gotten there anyway? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he just he goes GC. He could go one and a half, two, three and a half, four, five and a half. He still goes there anyway, right? So that's that's fine. The, uh, even though it's not the correct path to take and his destination is not the correct one, his end point was, was exactly the same because he's probably going to move these guys back too as well. So sometimes it won't make a difference with path. But again, if if you ever if he if he exposed this unit, then that guy wouldn't exist. He would be he would have surrendered or no quartered. So uh Things like that can happen, especially in a tight board like this with lots of units on both sides. Now that guy goes straight back there, and that guy that guy does the same thing. He just goes he just goes again. This guy he, he could either go here, then there, and then back because his destination would be F four, or he can go down here because he's not getting closer to an, a known enemy unit, and he's not getting it closer to H one. He goes down and then up. So now he's got a stack of units. Those, those are legal paths through there. Just the first one was illegal, but it really didn't make a difference overall. And that was pinned. I think the leader is in that. Uh, yeah. So he's got a stack of broken units there. So this unit here, the closest cover is where? Looks like he's going to L4. That's three and a half movement away. If this wall were not here in K3, J3, he'd have to go this way. Because that would be three. And that's three and a half. So, again, legal movement there, not a big deal. Whether he continues or not is up to his choice. He wants to get out of fire. That's a safe move. These guys up here, 
they're probably talking about line of sights and closer to who, who's he, what's it. There's a lot of pinging going on. So does J6 have to route? Does this guy right here have to route? Excuse me. He, he doesn't have to, but he's going to. And if he and if he does route, what what would his destination? Let's say he decides to route. I'm going to route from J6. What would his closest destination be? This is key. This is a big one here, especially in this cops of trees. It happened in my game. It's happening right now. J6. If he decides to route, which he doesn't have to, but yet he does the route rules come into play. What is the closest cover I can go to in movement factors? So what would that answer be in J6? What's the closest cover? J7. Yep, J7 will be the closest cover. This is fine. His route is legal over here. Why is that a legal route, Steve? If this is the closest cover, that means something else must come into play that he can decide this one over here. It's ignorable. It's ignorable. Why is it ignorable, Eric? Same distance to this guy here. Correct. Yep. He, he doesn't have to. He, look, it's out of range, everything like that. He's four hexes away from that guy. The same effect down here with the LMG and routing is the same thing. Exactly the same effect here. That's four hexes. He could ignore that. Can he ignore this location? Right, that's two hexes. That's further away from that guy, but how far is that? Four movement factors, right? So that's why we always look at movement factors and not distance. Now, across the way, he's let's say, okay, I'm going to ignore that. He obviously can't go there because that's getting closer to him. Can't go here, getting closer. So he has to look behind him. He has three other destinations behind him that he can choose to route to. Which one of those? or not if not all of them are legal route destinations since he has decided to route which one or ones must he attempt to get to which one he does he have to choose if there's only one or more i was saving the rail set why can't he go to l7 why can't he select L7? Clear the map off if you need to. You might be blocking something. Because L6 is a road, right? What's the movement factors that cost to go from R6 to L6? That'd be one, right? So from yeah. J6, that'd be one, two. So this location here would be two movement factors away. This would be three. This would be three as well. Does he have to go to K6? Does he have to route the K to, to K6 to get to L6? Right? Does he have to, guys? Since that's, since that's the closest in cover, that's just the destination, right? That's just deciding what the destination you have to go to. It doesn't dictate the path that you have to go there. So even though L6 is the destination that he has to select, he can go to K7 and here. Hell, for all intents and purposes, yeah. For all intents and purposes, he can go to K7, L7, then here. But he has to attempt to reach here. For whatever reason, he'd have to take that path. This would be the closest destination. And he could low crawl in either of those locations because there's no one adjacent that he would surrender to. Even if it's even if it's an open even if someone could interdict him in both of those locations, he could low crawl legally because he's won't he's not subject to surrender. Because no one's adjacent. So but L6 would have to be the the the, the thing. The same thing with the path over here. You know, F4, if you've got a broken unit right here. And H3, you know, and, and let's say this woods doesn't exist where he can't go there. He'd have to go to F3 or F4. He'd go to F4 because the path would give him, would cost less to go to. That would be one, two and a half movement factors versus three and a half movement factors. 
The broken unit goes to the least resistance, like water flowing downhill. You follow the path of least resistance. But you can choose a longer path. And sometimes you want to. Just keep that, keep that in mind. Keep your eye open for that. Now this unit here, he, this. Well, I'm see if this unit continues to move. And he continues. To move. Good, it's a good thing to get over here. Get out of line of fire. That way he could possibly get somebody back there. This unit here, where does he have to route to? What destination or destinations can he select? He's a full squad. He's adjacent to an enemy unit. To go to the closest cover. So where we know this is a leader here, right? Most guys just say, I'm just going to go there. Straight up. Can he legally go to J7? He can, but it is ignorable. Yes. Yes. See, here's his case. He could go here, and it's possibly ignorable. Who's he, who can he ignore it from? Uh, the hero. Uh... Yeah, the hero. The hero's one of them. These four, four five, five, seven. Yeah, the four, five, five sevens are another guy because it's the same distance, right? It doesn't have to be only one person, but it's different. It's further from these guys, but for these guys, it's not. So when you take, take that into effect, most people focus on the guys closest to him. I'm, I'm moving away from the two, three, seven. So this is a place that I have to go to, but this unit could ignore this location because of these guys. And so he says, I don't have to go there. So I'm not. So if he ignores this location, let's say he ignores that location, where else could he route to? J8. He could go to J8. Does he have to go to J8? No, because it's ignorable from the stack under the circle. Uh, if he has a line of sight, correct. Let's if assume. He's got a line of sight. Let's assume he has a line of sight. Then yes, then he could ignore that like location as well. Because that's three hexes away from those guys. He's not getting any further away from these guys. And then J6. So in that case, that's ignore. Let's say I'm going to ignore that hex too. I'm going to ignore this one. Could he ignore J6? Because that's two, four away. Could he ignore J6? Could he? He has to. He can't go there. Right. Why is that? Because it's, four, because it's closer to the 457. Right. Now he's getting closer to the 457. So what can this unit do? Where can this unit go? Let's say I'm going to ignore here and ignore here. He can go all the way back to L7. Right. At that point, you need to look up here. You need to look over here. So this is two, three, four, five, two. Well, this is one, two, three, four. Mm. But this this way would probably be, this way would be closer, right? Yeah. So what's the problem going that way? Into dive pool. Yeah. And we're adjacent to the 237. That's the yeah. kicker. So if this unit were to want to ignore these two, then he would, uh, they're ignorable. I think, I don't think he would, he could, he could still go here because these are, still, these are, a, he wouldn't surrender per se. He would just take interdiction because that is not the only route that he can go to. Mm. And he could also go, he can go here first and then there, then there. But again, what does our broken unit do for us right there? Not too much. Oh. Yeah, it's it's pretty much, and that's a full squad. So um, that would be that. That's again, that's only that's four hexes away. And again, if he has line of sight to here, that he can't go into I nine, right? So then you calculate it. Okay, I could go here, here, and here. So now that would be two, three, five, and that's the same distance over to L seven. If he has line of sight, to, let's see if he has line of sight to that guy. Pretty sure he does. Yeah, that looks clear to me. So he does have line of sight to G10. So he could ignore, if he wants to ignore this one and ignore this one, and he can't go to J9, J10 would be the closest in cover, but he could ignore it because it's the same distance from G10. But, well, technically it's not close to the cover because it's, he has to go through I9 or the J8. He can't select I9 because that would be getting closer to him. Even though it's out of line of sight, so he could ignore here, 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 and here, and this guy can make it back here as well. And we'll see what happens. Okay. Again, we're we're anal I'm, I'm taking time to analyze this big first route path because you can see in a simple infantry scenario like this, 
where there's not a lot of bullshit around. There's no guys like a level two, 10 hexes away. These are guys just smashing together, coming together as a bunch and just shooting at each other, breaking. And we're seeing how route paths can be hugely affected by units on the fringe, units that are concealed, what decisions you have to make. You know, identify when it's your when it's not your turn to route, you want to make sure your opponent is routing properly and you want to look at his unit and say, oh, can I screw him over? Can I reveal myself here? Does that give me anything? If it does, am I willing to lose my concealment? Remember, it's the German's turn coming up anyway. If the German is deciding to go off to a fire group with these guys here against this 457, you might as well drop your concealment and screw up his route path because you're going to lose the prep fire anyway. So in that case, you're going to cause him grief over losing a unit here. This guy could still fire, and then these guys are going to fire anyway. Again, if that's, if that's your plan to fire these units instead of skulking, then you might want to lose your concealment, and we'll see how that de develops in turn two. So there, are, you still have to make decisions in your enemy's route phase, especially if you're concealed as a defender, because he could route straight at you and he could route into you. He could route directly into that dummy unit that you have stacked there and just, ig just ignore it completely or bounce off of you. And if someone has a line of sight to that concealed unit, he has to lose the concealment. And guess what? If you were going to skulk with that unit, at least he'll lose your concealment. And that's how... That's other things you may have to consider. So, again, lots of different things you have to look for in the routing. Routing is very important, guys. It's so important because little obvious things like H5 being a safe spot, is it? Is it really a safe spot? You know, if if anybody here breaks, anybody here, let's say he took the stack, these four, five, sevens and went there and they broke. They're gone. They're gone. This is a break and die situation. So be aware of, remember when you're moving, be aware, can I get the hell out of there? If this 247 has to go on some sort of bullshit, you know, low roll tear, you know, he has first fire, he has subsequent fire, he has final protective fire. You know, if I'm firing a two minus one, I'm taking that against two squads all day, final protective fire. Because if I roll seven, I pin, but that generates a pin tash check for that guy. Keeps keeps him at bay. And if they break, they're gone. A break is a kill. So a two, even or two minus one, can actually kill those units in that hex. Even if they're stacked. Say you advance fired. You were just first fired and you did like a, a two even shot in the, in the defensive fire phase. And they break. They're all gone. That's a kill shot. That's like a 36 minus three. That's a kill shot. The, the, the end result is they all surrender. So make sure you're looking for opportunities to have your opponent. Make sure you know where, like, if you were to just, just decide if, if there are equal stacks of units, say there are two squads in H4 and two squads in H5, and you had a unit here or units anywhere else on the map, you know, if everything else being equal, which unit do you fire at? You fire at H5 because those guys break, they're gone. Units fire, if you fire guys at H4, they break, they route. Right? They route. G5, F5. They get away. These guys don't get away. Very, very huge concept that you guys are looking at. Very easy to miss because this open ground here. You know, even if H4 is open ground, like if H5 is, if is H5 is grain and H4 were open ground, and let's say you moved in either one, you're better off moving in H4. Even though you might take a minus one shot there, if you need to move in both these locations, you are better off moving to H4. Because if you, you, you can afford to break here and survive, you can't afford to break there. You know, the, the TEM is, is, is negligible between the two. You know, this is might be a minus one. This might be an even. You know, you might have slightly bad on that first shot. You know, obviously, if this is a stone building or something like that, then H5 is much higher percentage chance of, of surviving. 
But if you're only dealing with a, a one modifier back and forth, and if you have to move in those locations, you're going to H4. Like if, if this guy advances, let's say he's going to advance, this is open ground and this is grain, and the Germans still have a sizable force that can fire on both of those units, I would move my better units into H4 and my weaker units into H5 in the open ground. Because you can route. H5 can't route. So, little things like that. Little, the dice, again, that's why I said the dice don't mean a damn thing. They don't mean a damn thing in the game. This kills units. Not snake eyes. Not threes, not fours. A, reg, a normal morale check failed by a stack of units, which... This guy probably had a normal morale check on him, and all those guys broke. His hero took a shit, his 9 minus 1 took a shit, and the other unit down there broke as well. So somebody fired on that guy, and that whole stack is just gone. Right? It doesn't take much to break. I think we had a game somewhere. Hell, I think it was maybe Steve's game. I think it was a 1 plus 1 shot, and the whole stack of units just took a shit. I'm not sure. It was somebody's game recently, and they were high morale units. He had a stack of three units. I think they were armor assaulting with a tank and they just a nine morale, nine minus two leader and like three squads. And it was like a stupid one plus one shot. And yeah, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> he popped a normal morale check. And what happened there? <laughs> they all, they all got blasted, right? They all, they all went away. Yeah. Right. And that's a lucky roll, but it doesn't take much. It's a normal morale check on anything else. You got to be aware of that. And, uh, you know, I just, I just, I, I, I want to emphasize the fact that when you're moving, make sure you're moving, even if it looks like a sweet spot. This looks like a sweet spot up here. To me, that just tells me that, you know, I'm staying there and I'm, I'm firing till I'm dying. I'm firing till I'm dying. Or maybe if these units could fire, break a couple guys to give this guy the opportunity to move, that's possible. But, and this is, this is again, that's that's a tight spot. It puts pressure on the poles. You know, this is the risk, is the reward versus the risk. This person thought it was so, 100% on board with that. That's the game plan you want to go with? I'm fine with that. You know, don't tell me that this, is this the best position in the world? Probably not, but who cares? It's the player's perception of what, how he wants to conduct the game. That's what's important here. The medium in the back, he wants to preserve the medium, right? It's not for me to decide what the best spot is for the medium. That's where he thinks the medium is going to be. He's got a plan for that medium. You know, he thinks, I said, I need the medium in the late game and I'm putting it back here to keep it alive. You know, he could easily put it down here with the LMG has put a stronger fire lane there. Right. But it's at risk up here. It's a high risk up there. This is very low risk. He's preserving the MG again. I like to emphasize whatever plans you guys play, you know, you know, yes, your plan may not, there may be other plans that are better, but it doesn't matter. It's how you want to conduct your game. You've got your way of playing, play your style of play. If you don't like to, to split up half squads all the time, you know, it half squads can be a benefit as sometimes, but maybe you don't like bothering us. Maybe that's your style. I hate half squads. Cause I have to, you know, they're all breaking. They have a low morale. They don't have smoke, this, that, and the other. And maybe just don't, you just hate, you know, the slow firepower. That's fine, you know. So play your game, but just realize, take advantage of those small, simple rules, just like, again, the routing. I'm beating this like dead horse, but it's so important because nobody sees this, guys. Nobody knows. If you were to put this, I, I put the same question because I put this out on the uh, on game squad. Most people do they don't understand that this unit can route the whole way back here. Your average run-of-the-mill ASL player, nobody knows that he can make it back there. That's a route destination. They just, they just, they see their leader here and he goes right back to the leader. Right? Is that the safe spot for this guy? Oh, it's tight. He's got tons of units here, tons of units here, a couple guys here. You've got a half squad and two squads defending a broken unit here. Where's this guy going at the end of the advance phase? Where's the 237 going? 100% of the time. Where can you expect him to go? If you're the German. 
adjacent to any DM guy. Right. Let me rot this. I, I know where this guy goes. Let me rot him. They're, they're talking again. When you see things pinging like this, is what I love to see because these guys have been listening to me for like two years. Well, except for James. Uh, no, Steve Steph has it hasn't either. So these are new guys that have listened to my rhetoric for the last two years. So he goes to his leader. Fine. Not a problem. I don't have a problem with it. That's why the leader's there. But the 237 is going to go here 100% of the time. Why? Because the German turn's coming up, right? What's this guy going to do during the German turn? Right? Most likely he's going to prep fire. Well, you got a unit in H8, and this guy's adjacent to him. And if these guys are moving down, he might prep fire adjacent as well. Plus the LMG's there. He just went from four firepower to possibly six firepower if he can retrieve it. Right? Six firepower is good. Hell, he could put down a fire lane with that to stop the Germans even better. He's going to the LMG almost 100% of the time. So you know where he's going to go. So in that case, this guy's going to remain DM at the end of the route phase. And what's going to happen when, what's going to happen to the concealment when that leader tries to rally that unit? Does he get to maintain concealment or does he lose concealment? Do you guys remember? Is that a concealment loss activity, rallying units in the line of sight of enemy unit? Yes. Yes, it is. So he would lose concealment on the leader in this case. Now, the benefit of this is now the leader, he'll have to route, and it's the German's turn. The benefit of this, as long as he can't cut our route pass behind, now he gets to route with the leader back to these guys. That's another thing that you might consider is like, okay, fine. I know he's going to DM me again because I know he's going to move. But now my leader gets to move in the route phase instead of in the movement phase. And that might be more beneficial. So, but that's that's way down the line thinking. And he does have other units could drive. But you know where the 237 is going to go. You know he's going to be DM'd anyway. Did it make a difference in here? No, I think it was actually more of a benefit. Now his leader gets to move over there if he wants to. He could either move before or after. You know, his leader could just move and then the guy this guy's gonna route anyway so and you're only going to be able to route, rally try to rally one of these guys anyway so whether he's back there now or later it only makes a difference on this guy's fire so but he is going to fire six plus one in there so things to anticipate from your enemies and again that sometimes like that might determine where you want to move your units and again these guys are moving up here and again the four five seven here right he has a plus one from here from this unit but again if he breaks german's turn if he breaks for some this is four even from the lmg he loses concealment here and he surrenders now he's got a full squad there at this at this spot you might want to go to h4 you know he doesn't have giant stacks of units his best shot is a three a three shot here he might have a guy here a four six seven so you're either looking at a six plus one or a six even but it's not that much of a difference in the six chart, right? A six or a seven, not that much of a difference between them. Slight difference, there is a difference, but you could break and live here or break and die here. So dangerous, dangerous position to be in. And so he just continues to move. He's got a stack of units in the back rallying, a couple self rallies. He does prep fire adjacent, and he's going to skulk back. Fine, nothing's wrong with that. That's the game plan. Keep your guys alive for the for the Polish movement, and he is moving his leader now, and he's moving the other unit back. So, good good move. Fall back. He knows he's going to be kind of either can't cut it off, and he's protecting the broken units. Right. He's up here. He moves them back to a, a more better defensible position. He might take a shot from one of these guys. But he's protecting these guys in case he's, he he won't be able to rally. He'd have to he can only rally one because he's not going to get to the next guy. But it makes them vulnerable. And again, guy up top prep fires. He takes that four even shot. Uh, and unfortunately, because there are no enemy around him, closest cover this one here. So, again, instead of, instead of what we could have done. Is since he got he got stuck here, didn't he, guys? Do you see the end result of this broken unit? And this he got a lucky shot on this guy. Well, maybe not lucky. He might have twelve firepower on him. So this guy got popped, and this guy got popped. Well, he got DM'd. 
So if we could have ignored, if we would have ignored these and this one, this broken unit would be right here. Two, three, four, five. He'd be five right here. He'd be five there or five there. All right. He still would have been DM'd. You know, nothing else would be, but he would have been on this side. What's the problem here? Polish, remember, the Polish player turn is coming up. What are the Poles going to do this turn? Up, up on, just on the top. He's got a shitload of guys up there. He's got six guys up here. How do you, how do you, what do you think the Poles are going to do on that top part? Almost 100% of the time. Or maybe you should be doing this as the pole. Remember, every eliminated German unit is a path to victory. Every one. So you don't have to go to the, get, get to the wooden buildings. Don't have to worry about it. You need six dead Germans. And there are one, two, three, four broken on the board right now. You know, three and a half squads are broken on the board. Half the German force is broken. What are you going to do as the poles? What do you guys think? Put a guy in J7 or J9. Yeah. J7, J9. Only two guys. J7, J9. Both those guys surrender. You can't do anything about it. So which guys are you going to probably, probably put? You're probably going to put the half squad. Maybe put the half squad. Right? And then maybe both these guys go up here. That That's going to be shot at. Right? The 467s protecting J9. So in that case, you can slip a guy here into I-10 and the result will be the same, right? If you wanted these guys to surrender, let's say, let's say J7... I-10 is actually better. I-10 is actually better. And the reason is, if he goes, to, if he advances to uh, J7, if the half squad advances to J7, he's liable to uh, prep fire. And if he breaks, then that's that frees up that other unit, the broken unit. It doesn't isn't forced throughout. But with I ten, um, it 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 absolutely can or I nine rather forces them throughout no matter what. The result of the J seven uh, effective fire on the J seven. Right, right. So if this unit, what this unit could do here, and again, that, then we go to the order of movement. Let's say. Uh, this 247 is going to be busy with these these dudes, and these guys are going to be busy with these guys as well. Let's assume the bottom Germans are not going to have any impact on what's going on up here. So a safe route for these poles to take these guys out. Again, you go J9, J7, right? That locks it up, but there are other avenues you could also prove. This guy can fire on both those locations. You know, if if that's if he knows that, right? You probably want to move your, your 237 and what you might want to do is you might want to um, non-assault. This is an option you have. Again, this is a tactic that you can use. Non-assault the 237 here to try to bait this guy's fire. Because like Pete says, you don't necessarily have to be in J7, but you could be over here. So if he, if you're essentially what you're doing is you're soaking off the German's full firepower here. You're going to be a four even shot. You know, does he take it? Does he not? I don't know. You know, that's what you have to decide that well, how you know your opponent. If he takes that shot, this 457 and these guys are going to be occupying these locations pretty easily because that'll be a two, two even shot. So that's a lot safer to go versus the 457 moving first. Right. If a unit is here in J6 or J7, this unit's going to have to surrender to any unit that's adjacent to him. So if you ha manage to get a, let's say, just the half squad here in J J6 and and you get a, a unit here in I8 and then you have one here, like Pete suggests, in I10, which is out of line of sight, you know, maybe the mortar guy goes 2-3 and that's all the further he can move anyway. Put him there, right? You know, not a bad spot for the mortar anyway because he gets to pound these positions over here. This unit will still be interdicted in K10 and still be adjacent to him. So that one, two, three, seven will capture that guy. And then if you put a unit here, he has to route. Well, if you also have an interdictable location in K8 from some other unit, like in J6, then this unit will have to throw out to someone who's adjacent to him as well. So it will be very easy for the poles to get in a position. There's a number of positions he could take. I mean, these guys could go full bore two, three, four ahead of him 
right? If this guy's first fired at someone closer, I'm moving that 457 ahead of that unit. So he surrenders in my direction because that gives me one or two more hexes. And now I advance into L10, into cover, you know, trying to get past a German unit. Because these guys will simply just surrender to you. You know, you could do it any number of ways. However, what if you want to be more conservative, definitely kind of just go to adjacent and pick them off that way. Or you can blow by them, get ahead of them, and have them kind of surrender in your general direction. It de just depends on whether you want to be more aggressive or a little bit more conservative. Again, that's your choice as a player. But that's what we're looking at. We're just looking to see how to get these guys to surrender to us. How you get it done is based upon your decisions. But those guys, for all intents and purposes, are gone. All right, they're gone. So you've just lost two units. These are two squads that you're not going to be able to get back. Even if this squad fires, let's say, breaks a unit in J6, the Poles just have too many units. You know, if he breaks here, his subscriptions fire, breaks that guy, it doesn't matter. He just moves up a guy here and moves up a guy here that you can't fire at. And you simply can't stop those units from being eliminated. It's just it's just not possible at this point in the game. So, um, again, something to think about when you're routing. When you're routing, it's like, can I survive that location? Can I be alive in that location later? You know, can I rally? Is it an eight morale unit? Do I have a nine minus two leader and an eight morale unit in J seven? Even if I'm DM'd, I'm probably going to rally. You know, it's a really good chance of rallying at that point. But a normal squad in an eight minus zero leader, oh, that's rough. That's like a four, four versus a seven. You have like a 25% chance of, of, of rallying, very difficult. And then you're stuck in this situation where he has to go up and then just die the next turn. This is what we want to avoid as squad leaders, guys. Situation like this. Yes, it's unfortunate he broke. He got probably the first shot that got on him, he broke. It's unfortunate. But... Again, this guy was in a position to give us a benefit of broken units down here previously. You know, he couldn't have known, you know, which direction the poles were going to go high, heavy or high or whatever. I mean, sometimes these guys fire down here 12 plus 3. Somebody shot up here and broke him. Doesn't matter what the fire chart was, he broke, you know. Again, go ahead. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why the guy in J can't route first to J7. Since he's not moving closer to unit. No, no, it's it's the uh it's the uh uh it's the route phase right now. He routed up there. He just routed up there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're just projecting for the next turn. See what the poles are gonna do for next turns, Jack. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Good point. So he was in J seven, Jack. He may have come late. So he had to route up to J eight. Because he couldn't see these guys over here. He couldn't yeah, ignore J8. Yeah. So that's okay. So we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll punch through this. Uh, oh, so I guess he, I guess he was, he got broken. So this guy could DM. So he's punched back again. Same thing. We could pound units back here. We could still draw that same fire for the four, six, sevens. And then these units could try to make their way back here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, he's still route there. He's essentially going to be gone anyway within a turn or two. Unless he does a, a lucky self-rally. I forgot that he had, he had still moved. If he didn't route, he didn't have to route. But he had to take interdiction to K10, right? And so this is the difference of taking the interdiction in K10 or low crawling to K10. A lot of players will low crawl to K10. Right? They'll low crawl there because I don't want to take interdiction. Well, then guess what? One, two, three, four. And then maybe CX to five and have a guy back here to interdict as well and move him up. He's still gone. So at least he's slightly out of range at the time being. But we'll see what happens to him. DMs are lost. That's the pole's turn. It drops another fire lane. Those guys just kind of move out. They, they still move into it. Take some shots. Not quite as effective this time, but that's okay. Good choice for a fire lane, and he actually got more shots this turn. Pins a couple guys. He does break this guy here. Impressive. So now he can route that one guy back. Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, because he didn't route. 
he didn't move these guys up to here to, to break that. So he did. That half squad does get away. He does. It looks like a self rally in M5 works. So now he's got some mute forces back. And what's he doing with the 247 down here? Where's he going? He's going to he's going to pound on these guys. Three broken units. At least keep them DM so he can't rally them. Maybe cause problems. And he's only got a half squad here, so he really doesn't have a huge force. He's got a leader, both of his leaders, and a half squad versus this guy. So he's making an aggressive move. I like it. Keep them DM'd. Otherwise, those guys would just rally pretty easily next turn. At least maybe one or two of them guaranteed. Now they're DM'd, and they now they almost have no chance of rallying for another Polish player turn. Huge. Essentially, he's trying knocking those guys out of. He's risking a half squad, but I think the risk is is uh, worth the reward. They can rot away. They just rot up, and then he just goes in terrain. Again, the medium still covering the flank. We're getting a couple lucky breaks here. Now, the one thing I want to go over, guys, and then um, and then we'll cut it here because it's seven thirty. This is one thing I've been I've been I've been seeing in some games. And it just it didn't happen in this fire attack. But this unit, this stat, well, this unit, let's say, what I've seen is this. I've seen both of these guys prep fire at this unit back here. What's the fire attack on that particular shot? From the 237 I5, let's say this guy was just moved in there. He's assault. What's the fire attack when, when that whole stack fires? Anybody can chime in. One up one. Yep. Yep. Why is it one up one, Steve? Oh, the long range for the half squad. And uh, the leader, the hero is outside his normal range. Right. And so, three, he, so he can't affect it. So he can't apply his negative one. Yeah. This is, this is, this is very important to understand that if you're outside the range of the, of the hero, he can't apply his minus one dice roll modifier to that attack. You know, he's, he could apply the half firepower, but he doesn't get the minus one. It's sort of like a salt fire, right? Your salt fire has to be within your normal range. The same concept applies to the leader or the to the hero. He has to be within his normal range. Of course, if he's manning a machine gun like a medium up here, if that were a hero, this minus one would cancel the plus one for the medium as, as the rules des describe. And essentially, he could fire up to 12 hexes. That's a little different. But if he wants to add his minus one to the fire group, then he has to be within normal range of either A, the support weapon he's using, or B, his printed range of whatever he's at. In this case, it's, he's got a range of three. I have seen instances in some games where application of that minus one has applied, and it has made a difference in guys taking morale checks or pentas checks. So just be aware that um, the minus one only applies out to the leader's range or the hero's range, assuming he doesn't have a support weapon. So, uh, very important. And, um, so... And that's why a hero with an ATR is the most horrible thing to face. Right. 12 hexes, uh, one firepower, you know, it's a one minus three. Uh, a seven's a morale check. That's a, that's a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous chart. But that's something that we could fire on. And that's, and he's fast. And he's fast with it. So, essentially it turns him into a mobile sniper for all intents and purposes. You know? He's going to have a better effect on a lot of units, cutting off paths, things like that. So um, I'm just going to have, again, I just want to stick to the uh, the sort of the two-hour range. Uh, it's late for most of these guys. Most of the guys are East Coast or some of the guys are East Coast. So um, uh, just to reiterate the routing, the importance of the routing, even in a scenario like this, um, the German didn't manage to get some units back to the central um, woods, and he has a decent defense right now. He's got a couple squads available. Um, you know, but it's important to recognize, uh, a, the proper route paths and the paths you could take. And as the defender, as the non-phasing player, what you can do to try and screw their route paths over when either a, you, you selectively choose to lose concealment or not, and realize that you might have units that are not 
directly adjacent to the bro broken units or within one or two hexes that can affect their entire route pass. It's a very, and this one is especially important to understand that you can route out of some of these cops of trees. This one, the one in the center in particular, you can easily route from that one. And these, these players seem to have indicated that some players will not see that and they'll get trapped in here. And essentially they will just lose the game on, uh, on their lack of routing skills in that instance. So just, just things to chew on and, you know, things like that essentially win and lose a game. They really win and lose a game and, um, something to think about. And, uh, and the other thing, again, one more thing, like the, L, the two for seven right here, he, he DM those units from E4 and he decided to move here instead of going into close combat with the leader. The leader obviously most, most likely would have ambushed him, but he would have kept the DM on these units at the beginning of the, uh, the rally phase, even if he was going to get a point blank shot from the beating machine gun. Would that have been worth it? Don't know. That's up to the player to decide. But that also pulls the MMG from either A, he, if he if he moves it forward, you know, then he doesn't get to shoot on this guy, and then these guys have to route again, right? And they have to keep keep routing. Or that might force him to essentially use the medium in a direction he doesn't want to. And that might give these guys on the bottom an opportunity to get the hell out of town. Things like that. So these are all decisions we all make. This is just another one. This is protecting this flank on the bottom. He didn't want to go to close combat for whatever reason. But again, two leaders by themselves. If he kills these leaders, he could probably just win the game, even with two or three squads. You know, unlikely, but you know, you go for the gusto. Go for the gusto when you if you're if you're behind a little bit. So, but um, I just want to thank you guys coming, showing up, sticking around, and uh, participating. Uh, I want to get through the other the other logs, and we'll we'll burn through those next time. And but I just want to cover the routing, essentially the routing issues that we have in this particular game, and then um and then we'll burn through to see how the the games develop. We'll go over Pete's game next time as well, and uh, to see how um just how the Germans deal deal with the problems. So and I think uh, I think you guys uh, might might enjoy some of those later on. So. But that's all I got now. I uh, My throat's getting kind of sore, kind of raspy. But uh, I appreciate you guys showing up. And uh, and we'll kick it next time as well. We'll cover some more some more stuff going on. All right, thanks for joining us for this about hour and a half of uh, the first, essentially, beginning of the war sessions that we're going to planning. I want to do more of these uh, because this, as the players play, they'll play more games. I need to kick these out so we can review them during the war and everyone could either hopefully learn something from uh, the group think tank and then have hopefully enter that in their game or clean up their game to make it run smoother so we don't have to bother to look up rules a whole bunch of times. All right, that's the idea. If you want to join the war, uh, click on the link below, uh, enter the... Uh, war recruits uh, i'll have the lot the list in there uh recruit me for war sort of thing and get your name on the list and then uh we'll slip you in there and then uh again this is not for the weak of heart one game a month isn't going to kick it you gotta you know you want you want to be able to enjoy one game about a week and a half and a lot of these scenarios are pretty short a lot of scenarios are three to four hours there's no reason why you couldn't be able to finish a scenario like two sessions max you know, two and a half hour sessions, hammer through and you'll be done and you start kicking out the games. So anyway, if you want to join, look below, you'll see a link down there, click on the link, follow the, uh, follow the recruitment section, the generals, and then I'll look you up. We'll hook you up. And then, uh, again, I'm going to cap it about 50. We've got 39 right now. Um, so keep, keep looking for it. And then we'll, we'll add you in there. And then uh, again, the war, the next 1940 war is starting pretty soon. So, uh, look interested. There's some other videos that describes the war, uh, session going on with a little bit more detail. So check that out. In the meantime, go play some ASL.